Part of the EBINIT conference is focused on the technology aspects in the industry, but we've also included a set of bonus tracks just to look at the broader, you know, South Africa Inc., where we are at today. And I've got Mr. Marcus Rotenbach, who's the Principal Investment Consultant at Omega Consultants and Actuaries, joining me to give us the, the Marcus 2.0 version of the State of the Nation, I suppose. Uh, Marcus, we really look forward to listening to you. Good day. Thank you, Chris. I'm um, great to be here. I've got a couple of slides to share with you today. Chris, um, part of the State of the Nation presentation um, was a focus on um, the BRIC summit that um, took place in August uh, 2023 in Johannesburg. Uh, but we've looked at it slightly wider, wider in terms of geopolitics and how that will play out in um, South Africa's case. Now, globally, geopolitics at this stage, um, we have to look at who the role players are um, in the world. I think the biggest and most important body that we are dealing with currently is the G20, where we have represented some of the G7 countries, um, but also BRICS and the Global South. Um, now, their distribution or um, how, how the players arrange themselves is there are certain bodies that represent the wealthier uh, countries where there's greater income equality, a longer life expectancy and so forth. Um, as opposed to um, the BRICS countries in the global south, uh, perhaps countries that um, did not share in industrialization to the same extent. So looking at the two groups, there's broad alignment uh, between those countries that benefited from globalization and um, <clears throat> those in opposition to those countries that were largely left behind. And those are the two um, large groupings of role players that we see. Now, looking at BRICS specifically, and uh, perhaps add on to that the Global South, um, what are the central themes um, in BRICS? And um, I believe that if you look at the global politics of BRICS and of uh, the Global South, um, it is all about uh, relief of the perceived yoke of dollar dependence or even previously as we put it dollar imperialism and um, also perhaps the prescriptive um, and coercive um, economic policies that would emanate uh, from uh, organizations such as the IMF and the World Bank. But that being the case, we had the BRICS summit in Johannesburg and it was very successful. We have to say um, South Africa put on a good show. Um, we are no longer uh, considered as the lesser amongst equals in the BRICS family. I think we've stepped up and um, we have shown our worth. Um, in the run up to the BRICS saga, um, it was all about Putin, but that is long forgotten. And um, one of the great things that came through is that um, our president, President Ramaphosa, coherently articulated our non-aligned stance. And I think those are all positive aspects that came out. So let's just think for a moment, what is BRICS about? Now, BRICS started life as an investment strategy um, uh, where uh, investments were made in uh, fast growing non-G7 countries. Um, that is no longer the case. It's no longer a case that BRICS is an association of fast-growing economies. It is an alignment of countries professing an anti-West or anti-G7 uh, sentiment. Um, we are seeing, and we are likely to continue seeing, uh, continued um, new entrants uh, to BRICS. We've seen six new uh, entrants recently. Um, that is going to, uh, to continue. Uh, we believe that even though uh, some may be excited about the new development bank or the BRICS bank, it is unlikely that the, uh, this will challenge the hegemony of um, the IMF and the World Bank in the short term, or for that matter, um, the dollar as the world's de facto reserve currency. 
what we do believe BRICS is going to be about is an extension of uh, China's foreign policy. Now, that being the case, um, we look at the new uh, admissions, two from Africa, uh, three from Asia, and one from South America. The question that I had is, uh, what is it that binds um, the BRICS, uh, BRICS countries together? And I had a look at various um, uh, uh, parameters, and I tried to identify what is it that um, keeps the BRICS countries together. Now, first off, if we look at general information, the only point that stands out here on this slide is that um, in terms of the inequality index, South Africa is the most inegalitarian society in the world. So we stand out. Um, the other BRICS countries aren't um, uh, unequal in the same way. Um, looking at the, at the economic variables, again, um, there's no single thing that comes through and that binds the BRICS countries together. What stands out is um, in Argentina's inflation rate and the interest rates are significantly different uh, from the other BRICS countries. And then unemployment in South Africa, 32.6, and in Ethiopia at 19.7%. Um, um, youth employment in South Africa, as we know, around about 60%, much higher than any of um, the other BRICS countries. But if we look at some miscellaneous information, um, interestingly, uh, <clears throat> press freedom index, South Africa, one of the countries in the world with the freest press, uh, where we score 79 on the index, where 100 um, signifies a totally free press, and um, zero means there's total oppression. Uh, what did come out recently, and um, that does explain some um, level of coherence in the BRICS countries, is the criminality index that was published a week or so ago. And um, most of the BRICS countries, as you can see, score on the wrong side of five on the criminality index. South Africa score uh, the worst at 7.18. And, um, and the crime resilience index that runs hand in hand with the criminality index measures the consequences of crime. And we can see um, in South Africa's case very little um, by way of consequences. Now, I believe that BRICS is all about bilateral trade and ComTrade provided um, a great deal of information, ComTrade of the United Nations. And if you have a look at bilateral trade, uh, you can see China's uh, trade with the uh, other BRICS members amounts to uh, $608 billion. Uh, but it's trade with the uh, G7 countries uh, nearly twice um, that level. Now, for the remainder of the BRICS countries, um, the trade with G7 countries, as opposed to trade with um, the remaining BRICS countries, we'll see that BRICS countries um, a little bit higher uh, trade with the BRICS countries than with the G7. So it's all about trade and it's all about China's trade. And I think this explains what is happening um, uh, within the BRICS environment. Now, there are some questions um, about the new BRICS configuration. First of all, um, there's a question that I have about the historic tension um, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Now, we know there's a, um, a peace treaty that has been negotiated and brokered, and um, the hatchet has been buried. But after years and years of um, difficulty between these two countries, um, it is a question that does remain. Then there's the relationship between India and China. And who is going to be the first amongst equals, particularly in the global south? I think in the uh, BRICS 11 um, setup, China is perhaps the first amongst equals. But in the global south, particularly as we had the G20 uh, summit uh, recently in New Delhi. Um, it is India that is looking to be the unofficial leader 
um, in the global south. Now, of course, there's the long-running border tension between um, China and India, uh, which erupted in shooting wars in 1962 and 1967. There's competition for dominance in the eastern Indian Ocean and China's strategy of a string of poles with um, naval facilities all through the Indian Ocean, which kind of um, uh, hems in uh, India's um, influence. And um, then recently, India also announced in competition to China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is a trade route through to Europe and the West. Um, China's uh, also opening up a trade corridor through Southwest Asia and the EU in competition um, with China. Now, the valid question is, um, is BRICS a manifestation of changing global trade patterns? And I think it could be. Now, global cha- trade patterns are changing and it's important for us to, to note what is happening. Number one, there's deepening divisions around the world, as we've seen um, the large scale uh, groupings of the G20 versus the G, uh, uh, the Global South rather versus um, the G7 countries. Um, there's trade fragmentation, where the new buzzwords are reshoring and nearshoring um, to prevent supply chain disruptions um, that we've seen in the uh, um, aftermath of the uh, COVID pandemic. But these interventionist policies cost money. And um, Anne Bernstein of the CDE um, wrote an interesting article about the seven sins. Now, the seven sins is not um, what I've listed here, but it does come um, interventionist policies at a greater cost to the fiscus. It does result in higher prices, reduced competition, built in inefficiencies, um, it delays transfer of knowledge, uh, constraints innovation, and generally it leads to a lower growth trajectory. But the emphasis worldwide is is self-sufficiency in key technologies. Now, how will that impact on South Africa? First of all, South Africa is a small, integrated and open economy. So from that perspective, we will be price takers rather than price makers. We're a regional power with some importance, but um, the policy choices that we make from time to time um, affects us uh, negatively. Uh, For instance, um, in 2023, the exclusion uh, from the G7 uh, summit in Hiroshima and the RAND blowout that followed um, in May 2023. So will the new developments around BRICS, how will it impact on South Africa and its people? So first of all, I think it's important for South Africa to be a member of as many of these groupings, Global South BRICS, um, as we possibly can, because it will bring opportunities, uh, specifically um, through finance from the BRICS partners, even the New Development Bank, that will uh, improve our position in terms of global trade and bilateral trade with other BRICS countries. And it will contribute to the de-dollarization of the world. Now, the same way as um, BRICS 11 is important, um, the global South is equally important. And South Africa must maintain a non-aligned status. But the question is, will BRICS 11 change the economic trajectory of South Africa in the short term? And um, this is where I think perhaps not. Um, Our problems or some of our problems, which I've listed here, um, is unlikely um, to be addressed uh, by membership of um, narrow or expanded BRICS or by um, uh, being part of um, the, uh, the, uh, the global south. But this just explains our position currently. Marcus, thank you very much. I think that gives a good perspective and a very detailed perspective on the impact for South Africa. And uh, I really want to thank you for the effort that you put in to put all of that together. Very nice, very explanatory 
and uh, I certainly look forward to uh, having another engagement with you guys uh, going forward. Thank you very much. My pleasure.